It has the biggest volcanic plumes that we know of with exotic sulfurous compositions, the highest temperature lavas that we've detected. It's as hot as 1800 degrees Kelvin. So Io wins lots of awards for being extreme. Some of us love Io just for its own sake, but it's also a, a laboratory for understanding other planets, especially the, the terrestrial planets very early in their history, uh, when they were hotter, they had more heat. Uh, this was a time when, when life first formed, when plate tectonics was getting going. We'd, we'd, in many ways, studying very early Earth is like studying another planet. Understanding Io might teach us something fundamental. I'd like to understand that type of volcanic eruption without having one happen on Earth today. That would be unfortunate for all of us living here. Io, that's happening today. Very high fusion rate volcanism, more active than the most active volcanoes we usually have on Earth. And it changes our whole view of how planets work. For terrestrial planets like the Earth and Moon, our thinking is, is that it's kind of like the lifetime of a human being. When you're young, you're energetic and active, and then you get more quiescent and more and more quiescent, then you die. Boring. Well, these outer planet satellites are much more like the Hindu life cycle, where you can be reborn and, and go through all sorts of cycles of activity. So a very different concept of how planets work. We have no shortage of all of, of unanswered questions and mysteries uh, throughout the solar system and beyond. Right, Io is um, a little bit larger than Earth's moon. Uh, it's one of four large moons of Jupiter. It's the innermost of the four large moons. And three of these moons are in a, a resonance. So every time Ganymede orbits Jupiter once, Europa orbits twice, and Io orbits four times. This means that the, the, the distance to massive Jupiter is varying, and the whole moon changes its shape where the surface of the moon rises and sinks as much as 100 meters. In the case of Io, every 42 hours, that changing of shape, it's like bending a piece of metal back and forth. It heats it up. So we've proposed the Io Volcano Observer in the Discovery Program. That's NASA's low-cost category of planetary mission. But uh, this mission would make 10 close flybys of Io while orbiting uh, Jupiter. It has a suite of instruments. And the tour is designed so that we fly by Io at just the right times and places. Uh, in order to measure the, the tidal gravity signature, we have to have pairs of identical flybys, one when Io is closest to Jupiter and one that's otherwise identical, but when Io is furthest from Jupiter. So it sees the same signal, except that this difference in range to, to Jupiter, which changes the shape of, of Io. That'll tell us really what's going on inside Io. Does it really have a magma ocean? And even if it has a magma ocean, what type of magma ocean? That's really, I think, the most fundamental thing. And we need to get a spacecraft that makes close flybys of, of Io at a minimum. Landing on Io and orbiting Io would be even better. We have to understand though, <clears throat> Io is deep within the intense radiation of, of Jupiter. So Jupiter has a very powerful magnetosphere. So it's a very high radiation environment. So it's very tough on electronics. So, you know, we're not going to explore Io the way we have Mars with these long-lived rovers on the surface unless we have a revolution in, in electronics and how, how to withstand the radiation. Um, so fast flybys is, is the way around that for now. Uh, get, get in there close, get a bunch of data and get out of that radiation as fast as you can. There are volcanic plumes up to several hundred kilometers high, uh, very spectacular and uh, that some of that material may be uh, it could directly escape Io, but also that high radiation environment and those energetic particles interact and strip off material. If we're so close that we're in flying through a, a lava fountain, <laughs> that would obviously be bad for a spacecraft. Uh, we hope to fly through the upper parts of plumes where it's, it's mostly gas and very small particles that, that are not hazardous. Uh, of course, if you 
make a math error and impact IO, that would not be good unless it was intentional to dispose of the spacecraft at the end of the mission. And that is how we would plan to, to end it all after the, the mission is over. It would mean a great deal to me to see this mission go forward. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be the one leading the mission uh, at I.O. You know, it has to be the next generation. You have to think in terms of multi-generations when you're dealing with the outer solar system, and especially when you have to spend a decade just, just to get the mission approved. Uh, so for me, though, that's all fine. Uh, I get it started, and then I enjoy life and enjoy watching uh, others carry on. And I have no doubt that Iowa will surprise us. It's 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 a very surprising place, and it's surprised every mission that's ever looked at it. The conventional thinking is that there's no way there's life on Io. It's too hot. Well, it's only hot over one percent of the surface. Uh, there are certainly places with with better temperatures. It's also thought that there's no water. Well, <clears throat> we haven't detected water, but we didn't think there was water on the moon either for a long time until we got better measurements, so we might be surprised about that. And also, what kind of life are we talking about? The only thing we, we know how to talk about is life as we know it, which is carbon and water-based life. So if it's some other kind of life, then who knows? All bets are off. So it's the surprises that will be the, the most fun and most significant.